you need to turn. Ah, okay. Can, can you hear me? Yes, yes, perfectly fine. Perfect. Okay, great. Great to hear you. Great to see you, some of you at least. And uh, I'm going to be uh, to give a talk, uh, which is, is a bit long uh, in, in terms of uh, um, title. So it's a machine learning methods uh, used for data analysis at LHC. So uh, I would rather call it a highlight talk uh, and uh, just to show you a long story of machine learning at HEP. Uh, so this is the first paper I found. Uh, probably there are other implementations, but uh, I think that uh, uh, that uh, it's most most probably uh, the implementations. I mean, uh, most most probably it's one of the first implementations of neural networks for the high energy physics analysis, and this is in 1994. Uh, nowadays, there are like probably uh, a paper or several papers each day, uh, particularly dedicated to the high energy physics and uh, machine learning high energy physics. And in fact, uh, once you have the slides, uh, you can click on this, uh, and there is a live re living review to show you uh, most of the papers that were published. Uh, so I'm going to show you the highlights, and uh, the highlights concern the Large Hadron Collider. This is a big machine which is situated next to Geneva. This is a up to scale the Geneva Airport here, and we have a, a collider which is running underground. Uh, it's a bit below the ground here. See, and um, we have like four big experiments uh, which are. Atlas, I'll get it here, then Alice, uh, LHCB, and CMS. Uh, so the main thing that you probably know about Large Hadron Collider, if you don't do high energy physics, is that it discovered Higgs was on in 2012. Uh, but there were many other discoveries that are interesting, probably not as much um, uh, probably not as much anticipated. And uh, for example, today there was a discovery of uh, in charm sector, uh, for those who know charm sector. And um, so I uh, the, the main thing here about Large Hadron Collider is in fact for us, the way it processes the data. First of all, uh, it produces the data samples with a uh, frequency of 40 megahertz. And uh, then uh, the first stage, at the first stage, this frequency should, uh, of data samples uh, should be reduced to 100, around 100 kilohertz. Then on the second stage, uh, this should be done, uh, reduced down to one kilohertz. And on the third stage uh, of uh, processing, uh, this should be, this should be, uh, there is no real thing about, um, about number of curves that you need to do. However, there is also a concurrency, which is the amount of jobs you uh, you have in one, uh, in one uh, simultaneously. And this should be greater than five to the power of five. Uh, and so we use uh, lots of supercomputers. The thing is that uh, data processing is so complicated that we do not have um, them all at CERN. So we have uh, online, uh, online part, which is uh, uh, for sure the, the one which is producing the data, the, the Large Hadron Collider. Then there is a online farm, which is reducing the data sample, the data frequency to to a smaller rate. And then uh, there is something which is close to online and uh, to around uh, um, like supercomputer farm as well. And then um, we also have a dedicated, uh, let's say uh, here I, one can call it cloud. Uh, well, we can call it grid for a moment, but there is also idea, there are also ideas that we can go to a cloud to distribute our jobs. Uh, right. So the, what is uh, uh, to be taken from this picture is that we have a multi-stage processing with very aggressive rate reduction. So we need to reduce a very, uh, I mean, by a factor of thousand at every each step, or hundred or thousand at each step. And this means that we need uh, quite a lot of automated uh, procedures to uh, to actually develop to be developed and to actually uh, analyze this amount of data. 
uh, not surprisingly, uh, you will, if you look at the procedure of a, of a sample LHC experiment, this is LHCB, which I didn't write here, so but it's LHCB. Uh, you normally have uh, several steps of uh, process processing, and uh, this part is actually online part, uh, what, what I said uh, before, and this is uh, connected, uh, so there is a normally like a hardware trigger, but uh, for LHCB it's in run two, it was like this, then uh, there are two steps of software trigger that are reducing, uh, reducing the amount of events, and uh, then after after the online part we actually go to offline part and in order to actually do the analysis we have a, a dedicated simulation for user and though so the user compares simulation to the offline to the offline reconstructed data uh, and does the analysis then it, the paper goes out and uh, everything is printed uh, well uh, plus we also have a monitoring which is uh, overlooking uh, specifically data quality at the online stage but also for simulation part and uh, other parts like analysis well you might want to know where machine learning is and in fact machine learning is everywhere uh, so basically basically each step of uh, uh, data processing in LHC is is uh, full uh, is full of machine learning uh, solutions they are not currently uh, a complete solution, so they are, uh, they are just dedicated solutions to uh, do something, yeah, and uh, we'll look at some of the solutions that we that are used uh, uh, that were used recently. And uh, so the uh, the main idea is uh, that we actually have a lot of uh, machine learning, and uh, thus the target of my talk is to show you the most interesting part of uh, the most interesting implementation of machine learning and most probably uh, the problems that we that we actually have with implementing machine learning solutions at LHC. Uh, the problem uh, lies in uh, in this in this uh, Fact. So we have uh, measurements, and measurements are quite often, not always, but mostly, dominated by statistical uh, uncertainties, which means that we need a bigger data samples, and thus we need to increase the luminosity. Uh, but this actually creates a constant problem for the data flow, uh, so we need to process data at low data acquisition, levels. So I, I remind you that we have several levels and so we need to, to go to the first layers and uh, we need to put as much machine learning as possible there to collect, to select the really signal that is, uh, that is taken in the low level. So we need to uh, we need to put the machine learning solutions as close as possible to the data taking uh, data taking uh, part and uh, just to give you an idea of how the problems looks like uh, this is where we are today in terms of luminosity so this is the integrated luminosity it means that the amount of data that we uh, that we collect and we are here somewhere today so you see you see very uh, that we collected quite a lot of data but still uh, next uh, runs uh, the in next uh, starts of the collider the data amount will increase substantially and especially it, it's true that uh, after like 2030 uh, with the new plans of upgrade 2 there will be even more uh, even more data collected so and this is this creates a big uh, pressure to the solutions that are running in the selection uh, online. Uh, currently, uh, lots of uh, several LHC experiments, and not only LHC, but uh, we are speaking now about LHC, they undergo the upgrade of the trigger and online computing. And uh, um, this is motivated by the plot I showed you before. And normally, quite a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, several several experiments, they actually switch to usage of uh, uh, GPU chips. And this is very interesting. So for example, Alice will have uh, some, uh, some uh, AMD GPUs for real-time processing. The LHCB, it's not written LHCB. Ah, yes, it's written Allen. Uh, so LHCB ha has got uh, has got um, 
a new uh, NVIDIA farm which will be installed uh, and uh, it will be the, the farm for the online for the online collection of the data. Then there is also a CMS that is using uh, a combined approach to use this uh, and plans to use NVIDIA GPUs for pixel tracking and vertexing. Uh, there is a lot of troubles for this. No, sorry, not troubles for sure. There are lots of things to be done uh, about this. So first of all, uh, to compare to have the same uh, CPU and GPU performance, and this is an example of uh, LHD particular performance. So with the, uh, you see that CPU and GPU here, for example, are very close to each other, and. But uh, to our, from, from the point of view of our talk, we actually are interested in GPUs because this is a big opportunity to have uh, machine learning, modern machine learning solutions in the online, in the place where we, we are very close to the, um, uh, to the data taking. Right, so intermediate conclusions, so that we had uh, uh, quite a lot of history uh, in the machine learning uh, for data analysis in high energy physics. Uh, new opportunities uh, actually come with the demand of processing more events, and this in turn gives rise to GPU or FPGA based computing, which gives us hope that we can implement something interesting in, uh, in machine learning in machine learning solutions. Let's try to see uh, uh, what is actually happening in the, let's, let's say, in, in the last couple of years, what was actually happening in the last couple of years uh, in uh, the machine learning community of LHT. Uh, so uh, what we need to understand is that okay for sure for sure uh, we need more data Me needing more data means that we will collect a lot of uh, uh, that we will collect uh, a lot of data but this data will not be as good as smooth as uh, it used to be in uh, previous runs as an example i chose a random uh, so no uh, i cannot say which article i chosen but uh, i chose a random article and i show you here the ex an example of what is happening when you collect more and more data. So you see there is a structure here which is probably collect, connected to the uh, bed description of the signal and there are also some structures here and there and for example here you have a three sigma for the for the uh, for the for the difference between data and fit. And this is most probably connected to something which was not well described in the in our model. Uh, this is a problem, but uh, probably these shapes actually are interesting because this can be physics shapes, like here, for example, in Dalit's plot. So uh, here, this is a nice result from LHCB, and you see that LHCB is um, uh, performing performing an analysis of many body, so basically it uh, it uh, it searches for big decay into uh, lots of tracks, and then combines the tracks and tries to see which which are the uh, which are the uh, resonant particles inside these tracks inside inside the decay, and you see there are quite a lot of uh, possibilities here. And this uh, can be also uh, bugging the, our shape of uh, of like like I, sh I showed you before. Uh, this is this is going to be pretty, pretty cool. However, uh, normally we expect not uh, pure physics, but artifacts that are probably described by Monte Carlo, or uh, can be described by better tuned Monte Carlo. This is uh, an example of uh, of. Uh, Data uh, of Monte Carlo that is not well repro reproducing data. So you see there is a there is a difference uh, difference in plots. Uh, just an example. So any experiment can have uh, has got this kind of this kind of problems. But uh, this is not the, the worst thing. And the worst thing is that there can be uh, there can be artifacts that are hard to describe in the simulation. Uh, why it is the case? Uh, most probably, is uh, connected to the correct uh, to the concrete construction uh, to the construction of the particular detector, or like something something went wrong, and uh, it's very hard to uh, to to describe the screwdriver which is lying in the center of the detector and uh, thus we need a way to uh, to actually uh, 
uh, to actually uh, take into account the differences. So the first paper is actually pretty old. I saw that I, I, it will be highlighted, but okay, so it's uh, five years old. Uh, but uh, it's interesting because it uh, keeps getting um, citations from experimental results, so it's very popular. And I think I looked today and it was 150 citations around uh, uh, according to Google. And so the main, the main idea here is uh, that we can try to relate uh, the Monte Carlo, for example, to get a better description. So you uh, you have a in input of several histograms of this kind. So you, you see clear differences between uh, violet and uh, green uh, histogram, and you try to train BDT to maximize symmetrized chi squared. So the chi, uh, so uh, this chi squared shows the difference between the uh, the places where the the green and violet histograms are different. So you train PDT to do, to do this, and then you relate according to the weights you receive in each leaf. Uh, afterwards, you produce plots with better agreement, and afterwards you can uh, try to understand whether the uh, whether the effects you see are actually coming from Monte Carlo or, or sorry uh, are actually described from Monte Carlo, or this is a pure effect that you see in data. Uh, well, uh, this is one of the approaches, and as I told you, it's used by lots of analysis uh, currently. And uh, they, uh, however, there is a there is idea here that um, we need to uh, do something different, and different means uh, that we need to, instead of trying to relate, uh, instead of trying to relate the. Uh, Monte Carlo to match uh, something. Uh, we need to uh, we need to have a, a decorrelation. So we need to control uh, classifier shape to be invariant uh, to be invariant, for example. Through, uh, and we can do this using uh, some loss engineering. Uh, most recent result. Uh, so it's uh, this is a, a paper from twenty, uh, so from January twenty, but uh, it's implemented in Atlas uh, pipeline just recently. I think it's. Uh, right now. And uh, it uses the distance of correlation in, inside the loss. So you add uh, to a normal loss, a classification loss, you add also a correlation distance, which actually says how much independent uh, the, result, uh, the distributions are. And using this approach, you can actually create a decorrelated uh, classifier that can uh, can produce invariant uh, can produce invariant solution to some particular uh, particular shape oh, sorry to some particular observable so for example uh, this classifier was used to to uh, to to search for hexino and it's uh, very sensitive at lhc so you see um, in fact atlas is getting prepared to the new start which is uh, expected to be in uh, uh, 2022 uh, right uh, another idea of how to deal with these problems is to use the data driven machine learning uh, so we want to train machine learning algorithm not on real data, not but not uh, on real data, but not on simulation. Uh, this comes with a problem because for if we train machine learning algorithm uh, in supervised manner, we need uh, some kind of labels, and these labels are actually uh, contaminated in the real data. And the idea is uh, that we can try to uh, use maximum likelihood fits. Uh, um, and uh, you and then out of this maximum likelihood fit obtain the weights that can be then used in the machine in the machine learning solutions so the uh, there is a, there is a way to obtain the weights from this maximum likelihood fit and uh, this is called s weight the problem with s weights is that uh, in fact, they are positive for events which are in the center, very close to signal, and negative in the event, in the places where the signal is absent. This is due to the construction, and there is no way we can avoid this. Uh, what should we do? Uh, we can try to we can try to imagine a new way of dealing with these s weights, and. Uh, in fact, we can use regression to suggest the probability of being signaled based on these weights. So what we do, we construct a regression that is predicting the probability on, of, the, of the particular event to be signaled. 
based on the maximum of on the results of the maximum likelihood fit and then insert this probability inside the inside the um, the classifier training place. And so uh, this creates uh, uh, this creates an algorithm. This uh, gives rise to algorithm, which is uh, which is very uh, interesting because it's the best algorithm. So it's uh, actually it is, uh, yes, it's uh, this one, uh, the, blue, the violet one. And you should compare it to the perfectly known uh, perfectly known uh, uh, black uh, uh, labels, so the labels that were perfectly known, and uh, um, and you can compare it with using SVs directly or with CAD or with a special special algorithms, other algorithms. So in general, in general, the data driven machine learning can be done uh, if you have any idea of how the signal and background are shaped in some observables. Uh, you will see more data driven approaches tomorrow when Tom is giving a talk um, about the guns. Uh, Sure, for sure, we can try to tune the simulation. So we, I told you that there is an artifact. If there are artifacts, uh, we don't. We are not sure if it's coming from simulation or it's uh, if it's described by simulation and thus is not interesting, or it's a pure effect and we want to actually study it. So uh, there is um, uh, there are several papers. Uh, I mean, uh, in 2016 there were papers also in 17 uh, that are trying to apply some uh, machine learning techniques uh, or statistics, but mostly machine learning. Then afterwards, machine learning uh, to tune the simulation, basically to choose the parameters of Pythia uh, or Giant uh, that that can uh, provide a good description to the to the data sample uh, that are used for training. Um, one of the first uh, approaches was done using Bayesian optimization, and um, uh, it's written here, for, it's written in this uh, link. Uh, you see uh, the idea uh, is that Bayesian optimization allows you to actually uh, look for the worst described parts and suggest that our next training point should be there. Uh, in this way, in this way, we are uh, doing, uh, we, are, we are saving the time on, cho on choosing the correct uh, results, the correct uh, data, 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 data places. Uh, it's, a sim it's very similar to, to tuning uh, neural network parameters. So basically they use Permint, which is a popular, popular library to tune the neural network hyperparameters. Uh, another approach would be to actually say that the Pythia is uh, is a generator, and uh, then we can apply uh, tuning of Pythia just like you, we would tune the generator the generator in generative adversarial network. And uh, in this way, we will be able to uh, to actually uh, have a bunch of uh, bunch of images from Pythia. I mean, uh, collected by some detector, and then bunch of images from uh, true uh, from uh, true distribution, and then try to understand whether we can tune the parameters, uh, whether we can tune the parameters uh, to match the these two bunches. In fact, it's an interesting approach. Uh, I'm not sure that. Okay, so there are gathering forces, but I'm sure that the task force started uh, to try to apply it to PFIA. So this is the results on pure PFIA on pure toy, but uh, probably probably we can try to do it uh, in a more uh, elaborate way for some experiments, a simple one probably. Uh, right, so uh, what I wanted to say here is that bigger data samples create additional problems that could have been neglected in the past. And a smart choice of loss function can address this problem, but not solve. This is uh, very important to understand. Uh, right. So another thing which we have a pro uh, where, where we have a problem is the uh, is to have a frequency of decision by neural networks when we insert it into the online environment. Um, 
All right, so this is a simple example of what is happening in the algorithms of online environment. And uh, in fact, you can see that before uh, before before having some, some kind of uh, algorithms, here is a Kalman filter, uh, you need to pass a lot of uh, steps. And uh, so, uh, in fact, the implementation includes several things like uh, in input absorbable staging. So you need to actually choose which absorbables will be used in the neural network or in your algorithm. Here is a Kalman filter, but anyhow. Uh, then you need to preprocess them, run the machine uh, solution, machine learning solution, and store somehow the output. So the idea is that we can try to reduce uh, one of the things here, one of the things in the list, and uh, in this way we will try to uh, try to increase the speed of uh, of the implementation. Uh, right. So uh, first thing that can come into your mind is to reduce the amount of input observables, and uh, uh, this is. Uh, something something that is uh, commonly used uh, there there are several methods under in uh, in the market like permutation importance uh, locally interpreter models uh, so permutation importance means that you you have to uh, have to have a permutation between one of the observables and see uh, for example here and see how the result will reduce will be reduced and uh, in this way we we'll try to choose the best model then locally interpretable model is more or less like uh, creating a, a local explanation of what is uh, what why this result is actually the, the the what it is and this reminds a bit uh, like a Taylor series expansion you can uh, look into this uh, uh, in details uh, and uh, like for example deep learning important features so just uh, which is called deep lift uh, just uh, choosing choosing the correct importance uh, feature important features in the uh, in your classifier. Uh, we uh, did this is an LHCB uh, uh, idea. So we used uh, uh, this for, for example, for particle tracking, and for particular particles uh, for particular tracking, which is happening in the very long lived uh, particles, and uh, they are somewhere some somewhere here. So so they pass uh, not in the beginning, but they somehow they somehow create it outside of the, the first tracker, and it fly they fly all the way down the detector, and. Uh, there are lots of uh, uh, fake tracks, and we need to recognize this. Uh, so we use a two-stage algorithm to select correctly reconstructed tracks. On the second stage, uh, we uh, of new, uh, the neural network is trained with ten inputs, and this is uh, this is a problem because uh, tracking should be very fast. So what we do, we uh, use a SHAP value uh, for particle tracking, which is connecting the game theory with the local explanations. Uh, in, so basically, it creates uh, it creates an answer uh, of the importance based on the uh, on the different uh, uh, inputs uh, that we can use for the for this or that outs, uh, the, for this or that uh, uh, algorithm. And it, the, create, the created plot allows one to actually uh, choose the best, the most important features. Uh, so based based on the uh, on uh, on each uh, on on many evaluations. So you see there are many evaluations. There are, there there is a uh, for each evaluation we understand we try to understand which is the which is the importance of the feature, and uh, thus we will have uh, something uh, which is. Um, uh, which we understand. So we have uh, this feature, which is important, and this feature, which is uh, probably not that much important, right? And then we dislike this. And the last thing I will go to tell you is that, okay, so I have a couple of minutes more, I guess. Yes, one minute more. Uh, and the last thing uh, uh, that we deal with is uh, slimming the net neural network. Uh, normally, uh, a normal deep learning approach would mean stack more layers, right? So you put uh, more and more layers to have a better and better solutions. And uh, the model might arrive a bit heavy to be used online due to memory consumption and inference time. And this is actually something that I did uh, 
in the past. Uh, so this is the results of the particle identification. And uh, uh, in fact, we stacked quite a lot of layer, uh, I mean, quite a lot of neurons in this case uh, to have uh, better results. But in the in the end, it, the model appeared to be too slow. Uh, and uh, training, uh, so we need uh, we need to deal with this because uh, because I told you so we have a memory consumption issue and inference time uh, and the memory can be consumed both online or, or in the operative memory and on disk. Uh, training small model can be a solution, but uh, it can from scratch it might be unacceptable from modeling point of view. It means that we have to choose quite a lot of different configurations, so you you can uh, be lost there. So the idea would be to uh, to try to spoon somehow the networks. And uh, the things which are used currently in uh, several uh, analysis that I know in the machine uh, in uh, LHC is that uh, uh, the L1 pruning so basically selects uh, selects the best um, uh, the, the most uh, interesting uh, neurons uh, in terms of in terms of L1 then ternally trainable quantization uh, where you you actually replace all the numbers in your model by uh, three uh, three numbers uh, theta zero and theta and minus theta and so you can you can try to try to see the speed up or due to, due to this and you can surely see that you will increase the reduce the memory consumption or Bayesian dropout so this is an example so I just took a random example from uh, from the thing so uh, generally generally you uh, would expect to speed up between one and ten times in this way uh, with a small loss of efficiency if you if you overtrain the if you overtrain the model so there are several approaches that are that are as i told you saying uh, speak uh, that are using this kind of this kind of uh, slimming of the networks and uh, we are getting prepared for the next runs okay so uh, did it in? uh so the uh, final conclusions for me is that uh, plans for lhc upgrade poses a lot of challenges for the data processing. Upgraded hardware for triggers might provide a way out. So we, we, have, seen, we have seen that triggers are gradually shifting towards uh, something like mixed uh, solutions or GPU only based solutions, which is interesting for the machine learning uh, because we can, uh, we can use the most recent advances of machine learning uh, in this way. And we can uh, use a batch processing, which is hard to do in uh, CPU. And and this creates a lot of opportunities, uh, and thus uh, deep learning is actually uh, has got a lot of lots of people working on deep learning solutions for this so that uh, uh, for this so that area, and it will be quite interesting, I guess, like in the next uh, several years in LHC in terms of deep learning. Many thanks. Thank you very much for your uh, talk. Uh, if uh, there are any questions, please raise a hand. Uh, no, I see no hands. Personally, or I, I see one hand uh, from Jonas uh, Glampitsa. If I'm pronouncing it correctly, please, please uh, ask. Yes. Uh, thanks for the great talk. I have a question regarding um, this correlation that we trained such a tagger for, I don't know, for, for decorrelation of the background. They're using some, some sort of correlation distance. Can you, uh, yes, exactly here. Can you say a little bit more about this um, distance of correlation? How how they approximate this uh, these correlations? Because I, I see they're an integrator. This might be time consuming to yeah solve such uh, an uh, integral every iteration. All right. So they they, they do uh, what they do. They have uh, first of all they choose this they choose a function which is uh, actually uh, needed here for the. Um, to to create to create needed correlation uh, needed uh, properties of the correlation so like uh, uh, if you want uh, if you want uh, some kind of um, rotational or invariance or something else it's uh, it's put in the in the in this in this uh, term and uh, then for uh, for the for the 
uh, the the amount of time they use actually I don't know it's interesting so I didn't I didn't so I uh, I have to I have to check so I have to check I cannot I cannot tell you for sure uh, the, the amount of time they use for training this is an interesting thing uh, since it's an integral okay I don't know it's amazing okay. yeah uh, thanks actually for myself uh, this talk arises more concerns and doubts about uh, usage, usefulness of machine learning in accelerator physics than it solves but uh, we can don't have time so I have very short question maybe for 30 seconds uh, the, uh, it's well known that the problem of at least neural networks that you can't estimate the error margin for them and you propose to use them for triggers and we perfectly know that for triggers we know uh, we need to know very precisely uh, the effectiveness of this trigger how do you estimate uh, the margin of year of these machine learning tools for this uh, trigger efficiency precision uh, okay, so uh, so there are uh, uh, there are several uh, several um, channels that are like uh, candle channels that are uh, used to calibrate our efficiencies. So we have like uh, if you go, for example, for LHCB calibration channels, you will have this. Uh, Mm, you'll have an article describing this uh, procedure. So basically what we will do, we'll, uh, we'll collect those with a minimum, minimal amount of, uh, of uh, <laughs> let's say solutions. And uh, then we will use this to uh, them to collaborate, uh, to collaborate our efficiencies on the, uh, of, of the data we collected. So this will be a data-driven data -driven collaboration. Okay, uh, I think it's uh, uh, we need another half an hour to discuss this, and maybe we again we maybe we, we should do a seminar and discuss it later. Uh, so we don't have time, sadly. Uh, so I'm presenting the next uh, 